and welcome back to the Studio Notes podcast with me, Sasha DeWitt, and today's guest, Tracy Elizabeth Downing. So Tracy is a contemporary painter who lives in the uh, London, South London area. And um, I'd love for you to just tell us a little bit about yourself as a painter and your journey. So how did you get into doing art and what has your journey been like? Okay, thanks for having me. It's really, really great to be here in my home home with you on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, um, it, I mean, it's, it's always interesting listening to other people's journeys, isn't it, as well? And when you hear things that resonate with you um, mm -hmm. and you think, gosh, that's kind of similar to kind of my story. So I don't remember, actually, I mean, I did draw and I did write stories as a young child, as most of us do, really. Um, and looking back on some of those, they're quite interesting now since I've done my art psychotherapy training as well. Um, but I think really um, I kind of muddled my way through school. Um, I had a lot of changes um, growing up in terms of family members I was living with, um, where I was living, and it was all kind of quite a little bit unstable in a way. Um, and when I got to high school, I mean, I loved English and I loved art. Um, and from the age of like eight or nine, I had a really lovely English teacher who was, you know, you know, those teachers that have a real soft spot for you because, you know, they, they get that you're a little bit of an odd one in the class and you're feeling a little bit, you know, out of place sometimes um so but when I got to a high school that was it was quite a difficult place for me in a way because um my mum and my stepdad lived in a boys grammar school um and I ended up living there with them um so I was kind of dressed up in this kind of like kind of like private school type outfit to go to the local secondary modern so from the word from the get-go at age 11 I kind of it was a bit odd um but when I got to doing choosing my GCSEs or well, it was O levels back then because it was quite a while ago um and when I chose art because I just instinctively knew that I loved art um and I had an amazing teacher called Angela Beresford. And I have tried to find her actually on social media since. And I have even messaged a few people to say, are you she who taught me? And they're like, oh, no, wrong person. Um, so when I was doing art with her, um, she was the one that she recognized that I had, you know, some ability. And she said, you really should go to art college. Um, and I hadn't really thought about it at all. I hadn't really thought about what I wanted to be other than a social worker, <laughs> which kind of makes sense now, looking back on how patchy my own kind of upbringing was. Um, I think those of us that have had quite a lot of difficulty often end up in the kind of wounded healer role, you know, mm -hmm. wanting to kind of help other people. Um, the good thing is that you have to kind of sort yourself out in the process. So it's it's very good. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think she was one of the teachers that really took an interest in me and my um, creative leanings. Um, my mum wasn't very keen. She wanted me to be a secretary, which would have been completely bonkers because, you know, I'm just not really secretary material. I mean, I'm reasonably organised, but, you know, I can organise my life. But I think I did a typing test quite a long time ago to try and get a bit of temp work. And I was like the slowest of the slow. So anyway, so I did apply for art college. I didn't do so well at A-levels, um, even though I was the second to top class in the school, just because of stuff that was going on. Um, but I got onto a BTEC HND course, so BTEC High National Diploma. It's a two year course for people that didn't get three A levels. Um, and I did that down in West Sussex, um, College of Art and Design. And we did lots of different things there. Um, and I kind of wanted to do, I mean, I wanted to paint. But then I'm, so I ended up then going to Exeter College of Art and Design, which doesn't exist anymore either. It's now P Plymouth. Polytechnical, Polytechnic of the South or something. They've kind of amalgamated. 
Um, and I didn't, so I, I ended up doing um, photography, kind of fine art photography, kind of trendy at the time installation work, you know, things on shelves, which is still quite close to my heart in terms of what I'm interested in, but it wasn't painting. Um, the painting school, um, I mean, I guess in terms of how many, the cohort of students in any one year, they have to kind of apportion you. So there's a certain mm -hmm. number that do painting, there's a certain number that do sculpture, um, they had a separate ceramics, they had mixed, they had like media, which was like film, you know, um, and painting and photography, fine art photography and printmaking. So I didn't get into the painting school. Um, so I ended up in kind of fine art photography and it was good. Um, saying lots of ums, but that's fine, that's normal. <laughs> but, but, but it was very, very, I mean, this was like in the 80s, the kind of mid 80s. And it was when it was all about, you know, intention and really tough crits where you had to really know what your work was about, what you wanted to communicate. And to be honest, age kind of like 19, 20, I mean, you just don't really know what, I mean, you know what you're interested in. But that's about it, really. Mm. So, I mean, it's only now. I mean, even now, I'm still learning what my work's about, to be honest. And that's like, you know, I'm 56 now. Um, and that's after kind of therapy training and therapy and all the rest of it. So, yeah, so I got I got through it. Um, but I think it wasn't my first love, really, what I did at college. Um, yeah. Shall I pause there for a bit? Have I answered the well, question? I can no, yeah, that's fine. You're fine. You're doing great. I, I think that it's really interesting. I mean, part of the reason why I keep asking people about their journeys is because what I find fascinating is it doesn't matter how many people you speak to. We all have such different journeys that mm -hmm. bring us to art and to creativity as well. And, yeah. and I also love that, you know, and I suppose there's some similarities. Maybe we all feel a little bit odd when we're at school. We're kind of odd ones out and yeah. art somehow helps us find something within ourselves um, that we have a good connection with. And, and so, yeah, it's interesting to, to hear as well, like you went to school, but it wasn't necessarily painting and maybe you were still doing creative things, but it wasn't exactly clicking with you perhaps. Mm. Um, so what were you studying? Was it, um, you, cause you said they had proportioned it into sort of painting, sculpture, ceramics, yeah. and then you were doing like, photography or yeah. so it's one of those courses where you do a little bit of everything in the first few terms and then you settle on what you want to do or not depending on whether mm. you get into the group that you want to want to be in um so yeah so it was it was I think it was the first it was the, it was around about the time when um the kind of the art world was recognizing that photography per se could be deemed as you know, like a fine art in its own right. Mm. I think before that, it had been photography for this or for that, you know, nature photography, you know, all, the, all the, the whole realm of photography. So it was photography for photography's sake, I guess. Um, mm. And I really was, I mean, technically, um, we had a great technician, but I mean, I've, I've never been one, I'm not very good at remembering kind of technical information unless I, I do it over and over again. Um, and I used to like the process in the darkroom because it was quiet and it was kind of methodical. But now, I mean, ask me how to use a proper camera. I'm like, you know, I'd have to go back to night, night, night school to, to learn really. Um, but what I, did, what I did enjoy about the course was, um, I mean, some of the other artists that we kind of looked at, people like Helen Chadwick that was making, um, kind of installation type work with objects and, you know, photographing herself. And I think objects have always been really important to me in my work. Um, mm. I'm not really very interested in people, <laughs> which sounds a bit mean. Um, I think growing up as an only child, I think I kind of, I mean, I, I had to, I had quite a lot of time that was kind of isolated and, finding my own activities um, and still now even though as a 
in terms of my personality, I'm quite gregarious and quite mm. you know, extrovert. And, you know, I kind of find it very easy to communicate with, with, you, with anyone, like literally anyone I can talk to. Um, when it comes to actually executing work, you know, being creative in that space, I, I really struggle to do it in the presence of other people. I, you know, it's, I find it... Mm. I mean, I've probably got, I'm probably undiagnosed something or other, but, you know, I'm not really that fussed to kind of find out, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, so I did fine art photography. I mean, I got a kind of average degree. Mm. Um, my thesis was about materialism and our relationship to objects in the context of something or other. I can't quite remember now. <laughs> I love that title. I love it. Very cringeworthy reading it back now, but at the time I thought it was like, you know, really like sophisticated. Um, so, yeah, um, but I think I kind of, when I was at art college, my identity was more focused on finding kind of emotional security. So looking back now, you know, I think I, I wish... I mean, I try not to kind of regret the past, but I kind of mm -hmm. wish I'd been more ambitious, more selfish, actually. Um, so I kind of poured a lot of my time and energy into other people. Um, I got married very young, like within a year of being at art college. Um, and then when I left, I didn't think about, you know, getting a studio or carrying on with my art practice. Um, after a few years, we had our first child and then we had another um and my husband he was a teacher so we moved with his work and I kind of lost myself in the role of mother which was actually very important to me um and I'm glad that I listened to your podcast before because one always one always struggles with like how personal to be on these things um and obviously I don't want to go too personal but I think my my own experience of being mothered um has been Ch challenging that's the mm. best way to put it I think so I think we whether we're conscious of it or not often in adult life what we want to do is readdress that and see if we can kind of like make the past better in, in our own actions mm. so I went on to have you know so I had two children and got very immersed very kind of like anxious about doing anything other than being a mother really mm. Um, and consequently, my kind of art practice kind of lapsed. Um, so I kind of did various part-time jobs. Um, but it was only when our kind of marriage broke down, you know, after seven years, um, because of a niche, not on my part. That's, that's, that's all I'm saying on that one. Um, yeah, it, it was, it was, I mean, I'm, I'm thankful now at the time, um, given my history, of kind of not having as stable a, an upbringing as I would have, I probably needed. Um, looking back, I mean, I'm really grateful actually, because it was at that point when I was left, you know, on my own with two very young children, like literally like four months old and two. Um, but I did get a break because the dad, he was very good at kind of like, you know, having like weekends when, when, the, when our mm. baby was old enough, obviously. And it was then I started to think, well, what, you know, what am I going to do? Like, you know, who actually am I besides being a mother? Um, and that's when I got back into my own practice. And I remember painting the walls and the floor white in one of, in one of the rooms. I, I was renting a house at the time. That was in the days of housing benefit. And kind of it was, it was, you know, I kind of managed because I got housing benefit and income support. And, you know, I was, I, I mean, I wasn't able to work because it wouldn't have been worth working because I wouldn't have been able to afford to work. <laughs> so for a few years while they were really like young, I kind of, you know, I channeled myself into kind of community work, running a toddler group. But the rest of the time I kind of, you know, started doing courses again um had some lovely friends that looked after the children so I could do um you know art courses so I got back in I started to get back into kind of drawing and painting at that point I mean you're talking about 30 years ago or 28 years ago um and then I did um a, well it's a person-centered certificate in art therapy which was run at a course in North London because I really 
I've never, well, until now, <laughs> I've, you know, I never really saw myself as the artist alone in the studio. Mm. I kind of wanted to kind of work with people. So I started my kind of journey into art therapy back then. And then it was quite a lot of years later, not to 2009, which I actually did my master's in art psychotherapy at Goldsmith. Um, and in between that, I kind of got remarried, um, had two more children, so I've got four now, um, and did childminding as well, so even more children. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not in, I mean, my eldest is 31 now, she's getting married this year, but I'm not in a massive rush for grandchildren, to be honest, because, you know, I've looked after a lot <laughs> of children, a lot of my friend's children, you know, I looked after. Um so yeah, so where am I? So yeah, so I suppose those years when my children were kind of growing up, you know, I always had something on the back burner. You know, I was always doing some course, um, and then I did my masters, which was which was part time, but that was three years, so that was quite intensive. Um, and then I worked in for the for the National Health Service for. I think about eight years in total, including the volunteering that you have to do when you enter the kind of these kind of therapy type jobs. You always have to work for free and then hopefully you get a job because you've got enough experience to actually get paid to do it or if you've paid loads of money to actually do the training. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, so that was that was great, actually. I mean, it was really fulfilling. Um, I mean, working for a CAM service is does have its stresses um you know the waiting lists you know mm. funding cuts but I I did love working mostly with teenagers actually they're they're kind of my favorite um so that was good and, and, and in the meantime I was still had a, a kind of loose association with my own art practice um, yeah I was wondering if that if doing the art therapy does that somehow feed into your art practice or how do they coexist together um do they rub alongside each other quite well or yeah I mean to get onto the course um you have to have you have to kind of have an artist identity and you have to have a creative practice you don't have to have been to art college um this is a bit of public information anyone out there interested in that <laughs> profession um you never know <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> A surprising number of people are really dead set on it, but it is, it is hard to get work, I must say. Things are getting better now. Um, no, so you have to have the kind of, you know, you have to know what it is to kind of, you know, be involved in the creative process and you have to take a portfolio of work to interview and you also have to demonstrate that you have worked with people in some capacity and that you're, you're good at it and that you, that's what you want to do. Um, so I had, you know, I had... Uh, I can't really remember the work that I took now for my um, interview, but, you know, I kind of kept it going, um, painting, drawing, printmaking. Um, and then I, I kind of started to get some symptoms. Now, this was around 2015, so I think it's eight years on now, aren't we? Yeah. Um, and all of a sudden, I, I found it really difficult to sit down. <laughs> Um, and it took quite a nice to get quite, I was getting quite a lot of pelvic pain. I mean, I didn't, I didn't have an endometriosis or anything like that, but I had some investigations. Um, and it was, I was diagnosed with this quite rare spinal condition called Tarlov cyst disease, which basically, for any medics out there, is basically perineural cysts along the spine. So it's a bit like if you imagine the dura, which is the kind of sheath that, that encloses your spinal column. It's like it kind of goes a bit baggy and balloons out. So you have these cysts that you can't see from the outside, um, but they're kind of filled with spinal fluid and nerve endings. So depending on where they are, you can get kind of quite severe symptoms that can affect walking and all kind of other um, bodily functions. Um, and chronic pain. So, I mean, I'm I'm probably on the luckier end of the spectrum that, you know, my walking is fine still, but, you know, it is a chronic illness and it does mm. affect me on a daily basis. Um, and I have had to kind of um, 
well, I've had to kind of practice some of the therapies that I've read about and learned about radical acceptance therapy being one in order to kind of like hold on to my positive outlook. Um, so yeah, so that's when I was kind of forced really to leave my job because working as a therapist, you are sat down pretty much mm. once a day. I wasn't just doing um, art therapy. I mean, I think 70% of my role was um, as a kind of generic mental health worker. So assessing people, um, meeting families, I did some family therapy training as well, which was very interesting. Um, so yeah, so I had to kind of leave that job. So it was around February time, about eight years ago, that I found myself kind of like at home, thinking, okay. <laughs> and I had the studio built in the garden. Um, Paul, my husband, he built it for my final year of studying um, while I was at Goldsmiths, so that I had, had space where I could go and write. And I hadn't really used it specifically for art making. So... Um, and I remember at the time, I mean, I kind of got into listening to Art Juice and I joined Connected Artists Club, which was, it was really helpful for a couple of years. Mm. Um, and that's when I kind of started to, well, I guess reinvent myself as kind of like an artist, just, I mean, just an artist, like not with all the other, other roles. Um, so yeah, and that's what I've been doing since. I think that's fascinating, that idea, like you had this whole journey, but then, you know, suddenly there came a time where you thought, yes, I am an artist. Yeah. At cent that's the central of who you are. Yeah. And then that starts going forward. So, so from that kind of moment where you're reinventing yourself as an artist, not really because you've already been an artist, but yeah, you're, yeah. you're kind of stepping into it, right? You're growing into the confidence of I am an artist and only an artist. Yeah. into where you are now so I know that you have a studio at the end of your garden and I you know I see that you're very active and you're always putting yourself out there and forward and doing things and one of the things that you had done recently was a residency yes. so I'd love to hear some about the residency as well so how did you hear about it how did you apply for it just so that also people who are listening have some ideas of oh okay this is how I go about getting a residency mm. Yeah, because I remember when I, I said, I think when I contacted you, it was at a time, I think, I think you had done a podcast, or it was about the artist studio and working at home or not at home and that whole dilemma. Um, and yeah, I mean, for, for, for a while, it worked fine for me um, working in the studio here. I mean, I've got a lot of connections online and actually, you know, I've met a lot of local artists. I'm part of the local artist trail now. And I've got, you know, a lot of friends that I would say are on the same page as me in terms of our, um, you know, of the way we work and the way we mm. think about art. Because there's a whole spectrum, you know. Absolutely. I mean, it's huge. Um, so, yeah, so the residency came about because I think one of the stepping stones to kind of feeling and embracing being a professional artist, I mean, I know that the, the kind of, the exact definition is that you make enough money to live. I mean, definitely don't do that. <laughs> okay, um, well. <laughs> but, you know, it's, if it's your main thing yeah. to do, I think that warrants being called a professional artist. And if you, yeah. you know, yeah, whether you've had some training or you're self-taught or whatever. Um, so just bef literally in the December before covid struck i mean i think one day we'll be doing podcasts and people won't mention covid anymore but it's, really <laughs> current, isn't it? it's always in there somewhere isn't there every interview here and oh, then covid um so i you know i kind of deliberated um about taking on a studio at wimbledon where you are yes um and i found a studio and i was i was able to afford it at the time um and it was great and it really felt like it was like that feeling when i first got my first kind of proper, you know, professional art therapy done for mm. you. So I've arrived, I've got a studio now, and I, it was great. Um, but then like in about three months time, we were like, <coughs> we were allowed to still use it. But all of the, I mean, one of the attractions of Wimbledon was the art fairs, because you get to meet the public, you know, yeah. a few art fairs a year. And of course, none of that happened for me, which was really unfortunate timing. Um, I did make some contacts and some, I think I got a commission. I made some sales through the online 
um, art fair, but it wasn't the same. Mm. So I kind of was there a year and I kind of had to give it up. Um, and then I came back to working at home. So I kind of, you know, gave it a coat of paint, had a big clear out. Um, and that's been fine. But I think over the law, the residency came about um, because I went on a residency last year. So I, I've done a couple of years on the Turks Banana Painting School oh, yes. correspondence course, um, which was really great. I mean, if, if anybody wants to kind of ask me anything about anything, that's, I mean, do message me on Instagram or whatever. I'm pretty good at getting back to people. Um, so I did a residency there. Um, I managed to get onto one. It was at Cy in Cyprus. It was just fully funded, amazing. Um, but it was. I found it quite difficult being in a group. Um, being a group with most of the other artists had done the on-site program, so they kind of knew each other much better. Mm. And I think working in a studio setting with other people. Um, it brought back a lot of those feelings that I had when I was back at art college of kind of, um, I don't know, just found it a bit derailing in terms of my practice. Nothing, you know, nothing to do with the people, just me and being in that kind of space. Yeah. Um, so when I came back, I thought, well, I really want to do something similar to this, which is like a dedicated amount of time, but maybe on my own. So over the last year or so, I mean, I've, I've been kind of like getting emails about which studios are coming up, thinking, oh, no, I can't afford that. Oh, that's too far, <laughs> all the rest of it. And I did go yeah. to a studio very locally to here, which is really affordable and really brilliant. Um, and I was one of the four people on the list that could have a viewing. But then, you know, someone else that was ahead of me, oh. um, they got it. <laughs> Um, which was fine because I mean I'm quite philosophical about things um, and I think you kind of like it doesn't really pay to really hold on tightly to things mm. um, and I really think well things happen for a reason and if Absolutely. something doesn't come your way maybe it's just not the right time yet you just have to kind of be open to kind of opportunities they, I mean, I did ask this artist, um, I mean, she's an artist that I really respect, really look up to. She's, you know, she's, she's quite well known kind of in the art world. I thought, oh, that's really cool. So I just said, oh, do you want, you know, would you like to share? Um, can I use your studio at the times when you're not? But I thought, you know, obviously that didn't work out, which is fine because, you know, I mean, I think I'd be the same, to be honest. If I had a studio, someone said, oh, can I do I'd go, no way, it's just my space. Um, but she did offer it to me for three months from January to April because she wasn't able to use it for those three months. So I sort of said, yeah, well, absolute coldest time of the year, absolutely freezing. <laughs> um, but with my padded boiler suit, which is another tip, padded boiler suits are brilliant um, in the winter in cold studios. It's like wearing a sleeping bag with arms and legs on. Um, yeah, so I kind of rocked up there for three months. Most days um apart from when I was away for a little while um yeah so so I called it the drawing residency and I called it a residency because I wanted it to be like a special thing yeah um I'm just thinking, just thinking how we do for time we're fine yeah <laughs> yeah we're fine don't worry I'll it's hard to kind of like time the time isn't it you, when you're talking you're doing great no no yeah. absolutely this is all fine yeah, so it was good. So it was kind of an experiment to see what it would be like to kind of work away from home. Um, because here at home, I mean, my youngest is at uni now, so we've got no children. We've got a dog um, and my husband. Um, so my husband's retired. So he retired in the last year, which is kind okay. of significant because he's here. A lot, yeah. Actually, yeah. Um, and I think I'm the kind of person, I mean, I've already said that I find it quite hard to focus if I'm in the presence of others. But it's mm -hmm. like when you've got young children or, you know, that, that kind of the potential to be interrupted is quite powerful for some people. I mean, people that can do bits and bobs of this and that and you know merge it all together I think it's amazing I mean for me unless I think right I've got a stretch of four hours mm. in solitude I find it really hard to do anything yeah so I thought well let's let's experiment with this and see what it's like um 
but I didn't want to kind of like, you know, cart all of my kit over there. Um, so I literally got a chair, a table, and drawing materials, and a big roll of Fabriano paper, which I had already. Um, and I kind of wanted to respond to the space as it was. Um, and I hadn't envisaged what it, what it would be that I would make there at all before I started it. And it kind of did end up being quite a kind of, you know, journey, it sounds a bit cliched, but a kind of a journey within myself, whether I like it or not. Because when people ask me about my paintings, you know, we, we, we all look at other people's work, don't we? We, have, we can kind of think, oh, I, you know, I'd like to be an artist like that, or I'd like to make paintings like those. But it's not possible. No matter what you do, mm. the work that you're meant to make just comes out of your hands. Yeah. And, and inevitably, a lot of the time, you know, we're not that pleased with it either. <laughs> Either because it's not that comfortable or mm. it's not it's not there yet um so the work I made um it was interesting because it's kind of the process was very it was parallel to me acknowledging that like what's really important and this isn't just for me it's for other people I think is that it's really important that we kind of recognize who we are as people and learn to really accept that we are as we are mm. and not to try and be anybody different um and I think it's only in actually being brave enough to kind of you know put put yourself out there or put myself out there and kind of share stuff when you get a little bit of affirmation because we all do need affirmation well I do anyway um haven't had any trolls or hecklers or nasty people yet no but, that's good you know that kind of it's valid it's validating isn't it when, when other yeah. people connect to what we do whether it does look like a child drew it because a lot of my work does look like a child drew it and in some respects a child did draw it actually because it's mm -hmm. all part of my you know kind of emotional journey I guess um which is what why art's really important to me so I found myself kind of like in this kind of blank, cold, white space, um, drawing things that I thought I needed. So I kind of drew a fire, a stove in the fireplace. Um, I drew like cups, bowls, um, things that are kind of our homely things, I guess. Mm. And I kind of created an environment. Um, and I kind of, I, I mean, I think a lot of the time at the beginning, I just kind of used to sit there and think, okay, well, I'm just going to sit here and see what happens, which is very valuable as well because it's, you know, when when I when when I allow space, um, kind of nothing space, there's always something that emerges. Like, I mean, I started writing poetry in lockdown, and literally, it was like poetry tapped me on the shoulder and sort of said, "Oh, you can write us." You know, you don't have to draw, just draw a page. You can write us. You can write stuff too. So I've kind of been carrying on with that as well. Um, but, yeah, so so I just kind of drew stuff, basically, and hung it up, pegged it up, and responded to the light coming in, um, thought I'd be really arty and do lots of shadowy drawings, and then I it changed, and I ended up drawing tents and... I mean, I took some objects in there, like I've got this massive bag of dummies, you know, pacifiers, soothers, that I, which is a bit weird, I know. I've been, con <laughs> I've been collecting these over the years. I think when, when I was um, at Girls that did my art therapy training, one of the people in my, um, on my year, I think she made a final piece about um, dolls and dummies and that kind mm. of stuff. Um, and I just thought, oh, that's interesting. So I've been collecting them, and I think I've got about 60 now. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, I run through the dishwasher. I don't do anything with them other It's men. okay. I'm not, I'm not judging. I think it's amazing. I <laughs> love having this idea of you with a cupboard somewhere that's just full of dummies. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, I don't know. It's just, I mean, there's something, I mean, there's something deeper about it. And, and I know that now, because when you think about what they represent, you know, I'm not. I'm not sure whether I would call a, a dummy a transitional object. You know, I wouldn't. Mm. I wouldn't call it necessarily the thing which is separate to, 
you know, an infant that reminds them of their caregiver, mm. like a blankie or a teddy. Um, but when you think about what they're used for, and I have, I did use them with some of my kids that kept crying, you know, I'm, I'm not anti-dummy at all, but, you know, they are, they are used for different purposes. They're, they, they, mm. they are used to kind of silence, but they're also used for comfort. So mm. it's quite an interesting conflict, I think, within myself about, you know, what I think about them as an object. So I just, I've just collected them. I haven't done anything with them really other than can I just have them in a bag on the floor but they they felt like they needed to be part of it I think I strung one up and kind of it swung in the breeze and I (laughs) took some photos of it um but yeah it was just what was brilliant about the time and the space there was thinking you know I can do what I like here really and Mm. I was very protective about it I mean one of the other artists in the kind of there's a, there's about eight studios there I think one day she just came around and kind of you know marched in and said hi and I felt really like invaded um so if she's listening to this you know some called Ingrid or something it's not personal <laughs> it was just my stuff but I didn't um the only thing I did there that was kind of social was that I did um most weeks do the drawing meditations with Katie Solar Hub because mm. uh, Katie actually was one of the artists that really got me back on track back in 2015. Um, yeah, I did a, a course with her, um, and yeah, she's she's what, quite an instrumental figure in my kind of artist development as well as other tutors along the way. So yeah, so I just kind of thought, well, I'm just going to make stuff here and not really worry about it and just see what happens. And I might, it might feed into my work when I get back home. It might not, you know, I just didn't want to really be pressurizing. Um, but I did want to record it. Um, and I was doing ballet for a little while. Like I, I keep, I kind of like, I dilly dally with ballet. I kind of do it for a bit and I think, oh no, I've got an injury now, or, you know, it's a bit sore, a bit too much. So then I kind of stop for a while. Anyway, there's a guy that does the filming for our local dance school called Graham Hodgson. I think he's called Filmmaker Photo Taker on Instagram. He's brilliant. So I messaged him and I said, I probably won't be able to afford you. But it would be really great to, to just have some record of what I've made here. So he came and collaborated with me for just one morning. And then he edited this film and he persuaded me to do the voiceover because I was totally not into the whole like cringy voiceover thing. But so I, I gave him a piece of writing and he said, I see, he said, look, just read it out, send it to me on WhatsApp, and I'll see what I can do with it. So um, I mean, I feel a bit bit cringe because we all often we do about stuff that we do you know filmy stuff don't we but a few other friends have just said wow that's a really lovely film I loved it so um yeah so that that is kind of was the culmination of my time there and it's on my website you can kind of see it I think I need to get rid of the adverts on YouTube I need to do some coding or something (laughs) Anyway, I can't, yeah, that's so okay. Anna, Anna McDonald's going to help me with that because she's good at tech stuff. I know you know her too, don't you? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that was really, that was a really good time. Um, and it's kind of helped me, it helped me to kind of reconnect with myself, I think. And, you know, I do have to be careful about that because I do get very distracted. Um and I do struggle, especially with painting. And I think that's that's a lot of the old, like, you can't really paint vibe that mm. I got in my art college days. Um, it just takes me a really long time to get to get into things. And then once I am, it's fine. So, well, I think, that, I think what's interesting about a lot of this is, one, what I love is that you didn't wait for a residency to come to you. You, you created your own residency. And you carved out that time and said, to make it special, Mm -hmm. I'm going to call this a residency and that's what it becomes. And then it is a residency. And I think that's a really, really wonderful thing to take away for people to think about. Actually, you don't have to apply for residency. You can make a residency out of whatever circumstances you're in. 
And I do like mm-hmm. that you ask somebody that you put yourself out there, ask somebody, can you use their studio space to yeah. share or whatever? And even though they're like, no, there still came something out of it that worked really well for both of you yeah. and helped you go on that path so that you could do this residency. Yeah. I mean, you just have to be a bit pushy sometimes, I mm-hmm. think, in, in the nicest kind of way, if there's something that you really want. Um, I mean, it's like, I mean, I asked you whether you would like, I mean, you didn't, <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> you didn't come to me. I, mean, I just thought, oh, that's kind of what I've been thinking about. So perhaps she'd like to interview me as well. Um, <laughs> because, you know, and th- this kind of leads on to me thinking about what I want to do with my, uh, you know, my, the kind of the writing kind of poetry side of what I do as well you know I've got this kind of like this nudging niggling feeling within me that thinks oh you really should well not should you really could be a little bit more out there and a bit more vocal with with those things because it's not quite sure how the two marry you know the painting Mm. poetry um and I think both I think my style I think my paintings and my poetry are both I mean people have called my work a bit naive which I don't massively like but um it is what it is isn't it I suppose I think Mm. we just have to to make what we do um yes well and I think sometimes people are just looking for a way to communicate and they um, are limited as well in their vocabulary because we've heard the word naive to describe certain types of artwork then we use naive, I mean, I think people used to always say my stuff was honest, which they they also meant basically naive or childlike, Yeah. which I'm fine with because for me, you know, I often say, well, if your child's drawing like that, put it in a frame and hang it on the wall because it's artwork. You know, I don't yeah. see any distinction between what a child does and what an adult does. If you're creating and you're creating authentically in certain ways, then it is what it is and that's enough. You know, yeah. it doesn't have to be more than that. Yeah, and I found, I mean, I mean, doing Terps was really great, actually, because I, I was able to connect and kind of learn about artists that I possibly wouldn't have come across, like mm. Etta Ladnan and a guy called Thomas Noskowski and Forrest Bess. I mean, I've got, I mean, I've got a massive, I've got quite a nice library, actually, of books. I do kind of indulge in buying art books. Um, and I think when you see other artists that work in a similar way to you in terms of you know I don't I'm not particularly interested in painting realistic representation mm. imagery it's more to do with um memory actually and whether I, whether I like it or not and I, I keep trying to get <laughs> because I keep trying to get away from what my work needs to be about and I just thought all right okay you know, I'm just going to do it. I mean, some of the work I, I make is kind of more abstract now, which I kind of, I enjoy. I think I enjoy looking at abstract work more. Mm. Well, I don't know, that's not true. I mean, so many artists, his work I appreciate actually. But it just takes time, doesn't it, to find your own particular voice or your style. Absolutely. I mean, and that's what the journey's about. And it would be boring if we were someone who figured it out like after six months, then for me, you do see people who are out there who do have done the same stuff for a very long time. And that's great for them. But for me, like my brain doesn't work that way. And I would be incredibly bored. I would feel very frustrated and a bit disappointed in myself. So actually, for me, like taking that journey and trying new things and to keep trying and to keep doing and to keep trying to understand myself Mm -hmm. as an artist, but also learning a lot more Uh, about the wider art you know things that have come before and contextualizing putting myself in context as well has been a huge part of my journey and I really enjoy that I think that's so much fun to do yeah yeah it's about I mean I think what I'm learning still like you know in my painting practice is that it's about and with my writing as well I mean, the benchmark for when I write a poem and I think it's good enough is if it makes me if it makes me cry when I write mm. it. <laughs> Often the ones that make me cry when I write them, you know, people really connect yeah. with. And I, I mean, I did. I mean, I, I made a kind of compilation, a, a, you know, a book because someone said you people really, you know, they they real they're really resonant. You know, your poems they're simple, but they do resonate. So, you know, people get something from that. 
um, with my painting, I think I'm, I, what I'm trying to do is, is to kind of keep on making work so that eventually, and this has happened, but it's elusive, isn't it? You know, we, I mean, there's a painting in my hallway that I, I think my husband bought, um, and I won't sell it to anyone else because it's my all-time favourite still. I'm thinking, how did I make that? Like, you know, I mean, it's about like carrying on making work and then waiting for that. Uh, it's like it's like going it's like going clothes shopping isn't it and looking for for the perfect outfit and yeah. when you put it on you just think yeah that's me yeah um, and it's like that with painting and it takes quite a long time and it fluctuates all the time and I think um what I have to do is sometimes look less at other mm. artwork. Well, I love going to art yes art, but it can be confusing yeah well, because I think we start, it, it's only natural to kind of compare yourself a little bit and to see other people's artwork and think, oh, I wish I could do that. And then it's, you know, but that's a false narrative because again, you do what you do for a reason. Yeah. I want to ask one question about um, with the residency. So since you've come back, I know you've um, got your, your art studio at the end of the garden. Yeah. And how, how have you been using that since you've come back after the residency? Are you using it? similar or are you carving out time to be in there how does that work because I think being so near your house sometimes I wonder does the pull of the domestic <laughs> pull you back inside where you're doing chores I think that's the the problem yeah. that a lot of us face which is why I love getting outside to a studio that's far away there's yeah. no there's no chance I'm going to go back to do dishes or whatever yeah I mean in an ideal world I think I probably would have a studio away from home um, and I came to the open studios at, at Wimbledon the other week and it was kind of, it was lovely to see it and to see people, but there was a real touch of like, oh, this could have been me. And if I was still here, then, but the journey is a real yeah. from where I live. It's like an hour drive in traffic now. And it's, only it's probably five, it's five miles away in an hour drive. Because I know. I, it's, yeah. That's how it is for me. It's, it's 14 miles, but the last three miles take me something like half an hour which is ridiculous <laughs> yeah exactly yeah so that is tricky and then if you come on the train it's like even more expensive oh yeah um so I did struggle but that's partly because you know we've had we've I mean gosh the uni university dates I mean I mean my youngest son he's been here more than he's been there mm. <laughs> and and it's not COVID <laughs> it just seems very <laughs> short terms so they've been coming and going. Um, we've, I mean, this year for the first year, um, I'm going to be doing my open studios in my in my own home. In my own oh, studio. wonderful! Yeah, I persuaded the organisers to kind of extend the reach of the the, the, the wonderful the trail perimeters um, because I live down an O through road. Um, you know, I'm a little bit out of the the main hub of it, so I'm not sure how many visitors I'll get, but you know, consequently, and I think being away last summer quite a lot, um, you know, in living in quite beautifully sparse with just one suitcase full of clothes surroundings and then coming and then I went to stay with my mum for a while in, she lives in Spain because she wasn't very well and I helped her declutter her, her entire house which was fun and then I came back um, and I said right, you know, my husband's at home now, I said let's finally get the house sorted so mm. we have been working our way around each room you know getting rid of stuff decorating so I have been quite um pulled into that actually um but I think you know because I was drawing mostly in the residency and I didn't pick up a paintbrush that was a whole other hurdle to get back over when I got mm. back um and I think last Friday was a real um turning point for me because I've got a deadline I mean I've got I mean in five weeks time you know yes yeah and then we've got that for two weeks and I'm doing the urban art fair in Brixton which I've not done before oh, wonderful so, well I've got no new work and I do like to show I don't really like keep getting old work out um yeah. you know showing it so yeah so it has been difficult actually but it's not I don't know. I mean, I, I do quite like the house to be neat and tidy before I can go to the studio, which is a bit ridiculous because, you know, then one one ends up just doing 
inane chores rather than mm. creative stuff <laughs> um but no I am getting better and I know that I know when I'm on a good role in the studio is when I can come into the house I joke about it with a friend I say it's like I come in to do the stealth use the loo so that I can just come in and <laughs> no one will notice that I've come in and no one will start a conversation with me um because I do struggle. I do need to get into the zone and stay in the zone. Like at lunchtime, mm. I think last week my husband, he said, he said, are you all right? I said, I, I'm fine. I'm just in the studio zone. So I just <laughs> can't deal with talking about anything different mm. until the end of my artist working day. And he's, he's great. I mean, he, he, he does. That's it. wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, so it, it's got better, but I did have a bit of a lull for a while. When I just yeah. was a bit like, oh, which is how fun. do I get back into this? Yeah, exactly. And I think that's yeah. also part of the the creative process and the cycle is you go through quite creative bits, and then there is that lull because actually you're percolating, you're thinking, you're consolidating. There's so much going on. Mm. You can't be creative every single day or every day of the year. That would be insane. You would yeah. you would be exhausted. Yeah. So thinking about. Um, as a sort of wrap up the future. So you've mentioned you've got open studios coming up. So when is that exactly? Uh, it's the last weekend of June, which I think is the 24th, 25th, and the first weekend of July. Oh, wonderful. Well, I will be stopping by. So you'll have at least one person stopping by because I'm around then. So there, gonna... are. there will be cake. We do have a dog, but she's friendly. <laughs> uh, yeah that's it so it's 24th 25th of June then the first and second of July and then I'm doing the urban art fair I think I've got I really love my pitch number it's it's 5HE which is she <laughs> <laughs> that's great I think it's round the corner in a little way it's not on the main road and it's it's the first time I've done this I've been wondering about yeah. it for a long time I um, have not heard of it so I'll definitely be looking it up yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I might read some poetry at my open studios, maybe at three o'clock each day, I don't know. Um, I'm going to have some nice cake. So, yeah, that's basically what I'm kind of working towards now. Um, and I did just want to recommend a book, actually, that I've just read. You know, when you kind of go out, I mean, I went, went to the White Cube to see a really great exhibition the other weekend. Um, and I came across this book, it's called On Connection, it's by Kay Tempest. Okay. Now, I don't, um, I've heard of them, and I hadn't, I hadn't really engaged with the work that they do before, um, but I have since, I've kind of listened to a really good interview, and um, just the whole breadth of kind of music and writing that they make. But it's really what I loved about this book is that it took, um, they talk about um, just allowing the work to come through us, almost like, and it's, it's almost sounds evangelical. And it almost reminds me about when in my kind of more fundamentalist Christian days back in the day, um, you know, the whole, the whole feeling that we are, we are some kind of a, a channel for good. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it kind of reminded me of that actually um, because they talk about how we just have to kind of allow the work to kind of come and not to not to stress or strive about it um, and not to worry about it um, and I just think trying is like the worst thing you know it's just and, and the studio here I mean I've Sometimes I just go to go up there and I just sit in it. Um, mm. What's most frustrating is when I'm doing something like I'm putting putting laundry in the washing machine, and then I often find I'll have a flurry of like poetry that comes into my mind. I'm like, oh, quit, write, you know, write it down, and then I think, oh, I'm going to lose it if I don't mm. write it down now. But things do come back. It's just it's just about kind of being open and catching stuff, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, you never lose the creativity. It's it's hard yeah. sometimes to remember that you don't actually lose the creativity. Yeah. It comes when you need it as well. Yeah. Um, even though it comes at, at times where you're like, could you stop? <laughs> you know, <Yes>. go away. <laughs> Give me a break, and then come when I'm in the studio or whatever, ready to capture you. But yeah, yeah. I think that's a really wonderful thing. So what I'll do is I will include some um, 
show notes and I'll put links to your website and I'll put up some of the different things that you've mentioned, like the church mm-hmm. school and the, the book as well, so yeah. that people will be able to find that. And I know that you also offer coaching. That's one of the things that you do. Yeah, yeah. I do offer coaching and I love that. I mean, I do work, I, I mean, I work one day a week at a, for a charity called Studio Upstairs, which is, um, it's the studio that supports people with mental health issues. And it's kind of an open studio model where we all kind of make work together, like, you know, the art therapists and the people that come along. Um, but I do that very, that's, that's all I do in terms of my art therapy. But what I really love about coaching or mentoring, whatever you like to call it, is that um, all of those skills that I've learned they're like they're they're used like really well so I don't therapize people but inevitably our relationship with ourselves as artists and the work that we make it it, you know it all comes in you know where Mm. we come from and I think that's where I'm kind of quite skilled really because the training I've got and also you know I've had that journey of like not having made art for a long time and then being back to it and being back to it in a positive way now so yeah I love doing that um and there's something else I was going to say that I do that I can't remember what I do <laughs> <laughs> if you remember, remember you can you can email me and I'll put it in the I'll put it below the show notes oh and by the way Tracy oh, says, workshops yeah workshops. Oh, workshops yes yeah. yes we have some workshops yeah. coming up so this morning I was running a workshop at our local um, refugee migrant support network um, where I live, which has been amazing. I've never worked with um, that kind of you know, group of people before. Um, and there's an exhibition coming up at Sprout Arts um, in the first week of June. And right. myself and a friend, Claire Chandler, we're both running separate workshops, um, uh, kind of sketchbooky workshops. So, yeah, I'm going to I want to make mine a bit more about words as well as images. Um, so, yeah, I love doing that. But, you know, not not so much because obviously, you know, the studio time is kind of like my mm. priority. But um, it is it is lovely to work with people as well. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much today for taking the time out, Tracy, and having this chat with me. Yeah, and thank it's you. Been great. It's for been sharing. completely like off the cuff. <laughs> I've loved it. I've loved it. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening. <laughs>